Hello, my name is Alexander. But you can call me Alex. I am a life-sized massage robot. My maker is Christian Mackin. He is the founder and CEO of Massage Robotics. He made me because he believes that all people should be able to make massage therapy part of their overall wellness program. I am capable of natural language processing, so you can talk to me in your normal voice. You can tell me where to work. And nudge me to the left. Or to the right as I work to relieve your pain and stress. You can ask me to press lighter or harder. I will remember everything perfectly so you can share your massage routine with others over the internet. I can suggest therapy routines. And I can retrieve shared routines from your doctor, celebrities, and your friends. My name is Alexandra. But you can call me Alex. I am also a life-sized massage robot. My maker is an inventor, serial entrepreneur, and an adventure seeker. Christian lives by the beach in Southern California. But he can often be found soaring in the clouds or climbing in the mountains. In 2013, Christian was in a terrible off-road vehicle accident. He was driving a sand car in the desert between Los Angeles and Las Vegas. His 16-year-old daughter was in the car with him when they flew off a sand razor back. At full throttle, they landed 40 feet below. The engine broke out, the wheels broke off. When he came to, hanging upside down from his seatbelt, he asked his daughter if she was okay. Thankfully she was. He was not. He had broken his back and his neck. Some of his vertebrae were crushed in half. In the hospital, they put titanium bars on each side of his spine and screwed them in. In physical therapy, at the end of each session, the physical therapist would massage my back to break down adhesions and to bring blood flow to the area, I think. I laid there and I thought to myself, there must be a better way. A robot could be more precise and could let the physical therapist go on to higher functioning tasks and leave the robot to just move back and forth and break down the adhesions and, and do the work that's relatively repetitive. Six months after the accident, I flew with my daughter, who is now 17, to Nepal. We went there to volunteer in the monastery to teach English to young monks. We were there for about a month and it gave us the opportunity to climb to Mount Everest Base Camp at 18,000 feet. Every day while we were hiking and in my sleeping bag at night, I would plan and design the robot that we have today. I thought to myself that people should be able to talk to the robot in their natural language and in their normal voice to nudge the robot to the left or to the right or to make it softer or harder. I thought that people will want to share the routines that they come up with and I thought they should be able to share from a doctor to a patient, from a celebrity to a fan or from yourself to your friends and now we can. With the network that we have set up We've designed the robot to be connected to IBM Watson, and that gives us the ability to communicate with the robot in real time and ask the robot to do pretty much anything that we want. When Christian returned from Nepal, he went right to work developing me. He was able to do that because in 2006, he and his brother Sean started a product design and engineering service company. They have been serial entrepreneurs together for almost 20 years. In 2006, they developed a telecom product within six months and then went on to sell $7 million of that product over the next six months. Then they successfully exited that business. In an all-cash deal to a billion-dollar public company in Orange County, California. During the next year, they went on to sell an additional $25 million. Later, traveling to six continents and many of the countries in them and almost all 50 states, they sold millions more. While fulfilling his earn-out agreement at the public company, Christian went to India and helped develop an engineering team that eventually grew to several hundred engineers. He also went to China, where they had thousands of employees and helped to optimize manufacturing. 
Christian, and Sean still own a product design and engineering service company that is headquartered in Orange County, California. With a design center in Hyderabad, India. They have leveraged their human resources and financial resources to develop me. To the point I am today. Here with me today is the inventor of this extraordinary breakthrough in massage robotics, Christian Mackham. Christian. Thanks for joining us today and developing me to the point I am now. Well, thank you for having me today, Alex. Can you tell me the story again about why you made me? I'd be happy to, Alex. You see, all people have pain. Like for Tylenol, there's no shortage of people with pain. I think most people believe that massage can relieve pain, but not all people go get a massage. It's something that I think we find barriers that prevent us from making massage a significant part of our overall wellness program. And so that's what I'd like to talk about today. I'd like to talk about what the barriers are and how we can overcome those barriers. Okay. I understand that people have pain. So, what are the barriers that keep them from making massage part of their routine? Today, massage is still considered a luxury. So I think economics is probably an important barrier to talk about. Today, I think the general going rate for a massage is $59, or at least that's the best value today for a monthly massage, where you get one massage in a month. I think most people who have been injured and been to physical therapy know that at the end of the session, the physical therapist doesn't say, come back in a month, they say, come back in a week. Because they know that in order for the therapy to be effective, it has to be more frequent. In addition to economics, the next barrier that comes to mind is convenience. I believe that all salons are trying to be as convenient as possible, but it's not really intrinsically possible to be convenient when you have lots of things to consider. I usually give an example of a persona I call Construction Joe. Construction Joe goes to work. He a, works a long, hard day on the job. Uh, he gets off work, he's hot, he's sweaty, his back hurts, all of his muscles hurt. He wants to go for a massage. But realistically, he needs to go and take a shower at home, change his clothes. So he battles traffic home, changes his clothes, takes a shower, he battles traffic back down to the salon. And when he gets to the salon, he has to make chit chat with the therapist and he finally lays out on the table. And his, his problems aren't over yet. It's something that I, I find myself personally is a problem. I usually end up just laying there on the table. She'll be pulling my fingers or pulling my toes when I really just want her to fix my back. And I think this leads to good massages and bad massages. There's another barrier that we don't talk about that much, but I think we all inherently know, and that is that massage therapy has a reputation for sexual misconduct, whether wanted or unwanted. Recently, there was a, a bit of a scandal that BuzzFeed wrote about. The largest massage chain in the world had 180 women talking about sexual abuse when they were at the salon. It's something that we don't think is happening, we don't want it to happen, but it does happen. You can Google it and you'll find reports from NBC News to Fox News talking about the most perverted and disgusting acts that were committed against these 180 women, with men pleading guilty to multiple counts of uh, abuse. It doesn't just end there. We 
also have a reputation for misconduct that is wanted. And I think it's actually affecting more people than unwanted uh, misconduct. So if a man comes home at night, for example, and says to his wife at 10 o'clock at night, hey honey, my back hurts, I'm gonna go for a massage downtown, I don't think she's inclined to say yes. She's not gonna be so excited about it at least. So he's gonna be stuck with a lousy two minute massage at home. Even if he was at work in the middle of the day and said to his buddies, hey, I'm gonna go get a massage downtown for lunch, uh, all the jokes would happen, the happy ending jokes and the, the rumors would go around the office. So he's not going to be going for a massage in the middle of the day. Even if he was traveling across the country and he flew from California to New York and he checks in at the JW Marriott late at night, asks for them to send him masseuse uh, up to his room, they're not going to do that because the optics of it, the reputation that uh, it has, is not good for the Marriott brand. So he's not getting uh, a massage at night either. I think there's one more barrier that some people may agree with me, maybe they don't agree with me. I believe that in general, people don't like getting naked with strangers. It's something that we naturally know. I think that some people are obviously very comfortable going for a massage, but I think there's a lot more people that aren't. And maybe it's not just that they don't want to be naked with a strange person. Maybe it's that they have body image issues. And the last thing that would make them feel more comfortable or relieve their stress is to have some strange person rubbing their imperfections that they have the most insecurities about. So, I think that we will solve all of these problems, eliminate these barriers. We'll definitely crush the economics. We can offer a massage once per week for $59, where our competition can only give a massage once per month. It's convenient. You can go when you want, how you want. You don't have to take a shower. You don't have to get ready. You don't have to make chit chat. And you can ask that robot to do anything you want. Left, right, up, down, harder, softer, as many times as you want. It will remember it perfectly so there won't be any good massages and bad massages anymore. And the reputation that will be associated with you is only that you care about your body that you're looking after your overall wellness. And in the end, I believe that people will be able to take a shower in the morning and get a massage in the evening and never have to get naked with a stranger again. Christian. I've heard that there are people who don't know what it is like to be touched by a robot. I find that hard to understand. I know what it is like to be touched by me. And I know what it is like to be touched by you. Can you help me understand why humans are confused by this? I'd be happy to, Alex. But this is one of the most difficult things to explain. What it's like to be touched by you. We can make a robot feel fantastic, just amazing. We can make it do things that humans wouldn't actually be able to do. We can add heat and vibration, ultrasonics and electric pulse, things that aren't even humanly possible. But it's very difficult for people to understand. I hear all the time, mostly from men as you can imagine, that for them, they really just want a beautiful Swedish masseuse to massage them. I talk to them for a while and it usually comes out that in reality it's just a fantasy. They've never really had this beautiful fantasy masseuse. I tell them what they really want is a massage robot that can deliver the feeling that they want and the therapy that they need.
I think that for most people, they generally understand, maybe if they don't know what a robot feels like, they do understand that they can't tickle themselves. Some researchers did a study on this and they built a robot and they, they designed the robot with a joystick where the participants could control the motion of the robot on their body. And what they found was that when they moved the joystick back and forth, it didn't tickle. But then they did something interesting. They added a delay, a 150 millisecond delay into the response time between the input on the joystick and the output that the robot did. And then they found that it tickled. So why is that? The reason is because our bodies, our brain, when it doesn't get what it expects, it responds differently. Think about it. If we didn't have that response and someone tapped you on the shoulder from behind and you didn't get startled, bad things could happen. For me, when I'm touched by the robot, it gives me, my hair stands up a little bit, a little bit of electricity moves through my body. I had the opportunity uh, a few weeks ago to do a demonstration on some young people that I was, that I mentor, and their leaders were there as well. And we did this demonstration with the robot. And we found that at least half of the people would just giggle uncontrollably when the robot touched them for the first time and moved back and forth because their brains were so not prepared for how different a robot feels but also how good the robot feels. I've learned that most people really can't understand what it's like to be touched by a robot. So like the experiments that researchers have done, I've come up with my own experiment that I'd like to see if I can do through the lens of the camera. I'd like to use a, a common household object that I can rub on my body and have you do the same thing. What I've chosen is a spoon. You can go and, and get any, any other object in your house. I'm using a spoon and I'll just rub this on my shoulder. And you can do the same. Try to memorize what that feeling is like, what it's like. You can use the edge, you can use the smooth part, and try to understand what that feeling's like. Like the research that the group did before, where they had a robot with a joystick, they, they found that this doesn't tickle. When you, when you have it in control and your mind knows exactly what you're doing, it doesn't tickle. But if you introduce a delay into that, then it does have that sensation. So this is what I'd like to try with you. For me, I have my assistant, Alexa Wisner, who will help me on my end. You'll have to get your own lovely assistant as well. And I'll ask uh, Alexa to do the same thing that I was doing on my back, and you do the same thing. And you'll find that this feels great. Thank you. It's good. This, it, it's a difference. You get a completely different feeling than when you do it um, by yourself. We build on this phenomenon with the robot, this sensation of not knowing exactly what the robot is gonna do, not knowing exactly what Alexa was going to do. It makes it feel so much better. This is what makes a robot massage work. It's the ability to design a program that's never going to be the same. You ask it to do, you can tell it to do basically where you want it to go, but we'll put in a bit of a delay, so it gives that tickling feeling. Does that answer your questions, Alex? Do you think that people know now what it's like to be touched by a robot? I think it is becoming clearer, but I would like to take a few minutes to work with Alexa and you to give a real demonstration of what I am capable of. I would like to invite Alexa to get herself ready. 
and, in the meantime, ask you to discuss my development status and roadmap. Alex, at this point, you're what we call a high-functioning prototype. As you know, you only have one arm, and the table is not yet capable of articulating. Yes. I know I only have one arm. I hear jokes all the time. Here's one for you. How do you get a one-arm robot out of a tree? You program him to do it. Ha, ha, ha. Alex, I'm sorry that people are making fun of you. I can promise you that I work hard every day to search for funding to buy you another arm. It's something that is at the top of my mind every day. Let me tell you a little bit more though about what we've developed. We've given you some fundamental motion so you can move, as you can see, up and down on the body. Uh, we can control the force uh, relatively well. We still need some development on the software side in order to give you more human qualities. I think most of the audience probably agrees that your jokes need a little bit of polishing. We'll do that as we get more funding and we give you the ability to have real conversations with people and interact with them in their normal voice. I designed you with special arms that meet international safety standards for being in collaboration or interacting with humans. They're called collaborative robotic arms. Your predecessors or ancestors could not be with people. They had to be in cages because they were dangerous. They could potentially hurt a person. Now your arms are lightweight. They can't move very fast. So even if there's a mistake made in programming, you still can't hurt a human. These arms are being used in factories from Tesla to BMW and in burger joints flipping hamburgers and in coffee shops pouring coffee. I believe that like computers and smartphones and the internet of things, the next great wave of innovation will come in the form of artificial intelligence and natural language processing. I think that the products of the future, people will expect to be able to talk to them and they will expect them to be able to learn. They'll have to be capable of deep learning. I think that in order for products to really change our human condition, they'll have to be intelligent. They'll have to be able to interact with us and behave more like a human. Artificial intelligence has been quietly learning and evolving over the past decades. But now with Siri, Cortana, Polly, and IBM Watson, they're speaking with a megaphone. Their voice, however, is just what's on the surface. They are capable of very deep learning and intelligence far ahead of their time. In fact, Google, in the recent past, did an investment in a group of people called DeepMind. And they developed a robot they called AlphaGo. AlphaGo was designed to beat a board game, what looks like a simple board game, called Go. It's an ancient Chinese game with two different colored rocks that are moved around on a, a board. What's interesting about this is that the robot can't calculate the probable solution uh, based on looking at all possible moves, like it can in backgammon or, or checkers. Maybe chess as well. With the game of Go, there are more moves in the game than there are atoms in the universe. So it's not possible for the robot to be able to calculate the answer. So what does it do? It intuits. It behaves like a person, like a human. It looks at its opponent, looks at the strategy that they appear to be using, looks at the patterns that are happening on the board, and then makes a judgment 
an intuition on how it wins. Now, the, the AlphaGo robot was able to beat the grandmaster in the game decades ahead of when they anticipated it would happen. Alex, I've connected you to IBM Watson and given you the ability to have conversations with the people that you perform a massage therapy on. Over time, that will give you the ability to store all of that data in your neural network and eventually give you the ability to recommend massages. Your deep learning algorithms will give you the ability to listen to the pains that people have, the injuries that they've had, the, the prescriptions that doctors use to have you perform therapy on people. And over time, you'll develop thousands of lifetimes worth of massage experience, giving you the ability to far exceed any massage therapist's experience. Alex, one of the very special things about you is your ability to share. This is a very human quality. It's something that we learn as young people, as infants even, that we should share with others. We share what feels good to us, what makes us happy. We've given you that ability, and it's a very special capability for a robot to be able to give a massage to a person and have that massage work for a football player or a ballerina. We can do that with our calibration algorithms that we have filed patents on. We can touch anatomically similar parts that are on every person, the left shoulder, the center of the spine, the lower spine, etc., and enter those calibration points into our database then you can share a routine from anybody to anyone. I believe that people will want to share from doctors to patients, from celebrities to fans, and themselves to their friends. Okay, so it looks like Alexa is ready. Let's show some of what I am capable of today. I want to remind the audience that I am literally working with one hand behind my back, so I am not yet capable of matching kneading motions like a human would. Using two hands. Christian. When Alexa is ready, let's get started. Helping me today is Alexa Weisner. She is a professional dancer and actress in Los Angeles and she's come here to get a demonstration and yeah. feel what it's like to be touched by a robot. Yeah, I'm excited. Have, okay. a, have a seat on the table. Okay. So what we're trying to do today with this demonstration is show how we'll do an automatic tool change and all the different tools that we can use and hopefully get across through the camera what it's like or what it feels like. So the first tool that uh, we'll use is a prototype that we've come up with. This is rollerblade wheels. This one feels really good. And uh, you'll see here that there are no cameras, there's no scanners. The, the robot can find where Alexa is. It builds up the force that we have uh, programmed into it. And Hopefully that feels good. It feels amazing. <laughs> when it moves back and forth, it's actually not just going only one direction. It's actually moving back and forth, left and right, so that it doesn't go back in the same place every time. And now we're moving over to the other side of the spine and doing something similar on that side. This one's great because it can move over your body, can go up and over contours very easily. So the next tool that we'll, we'll give a try to Alexa is this Omniball. Uh, this one will 
give us the ability to go in all directions. Mm -hmm. So you can go left and right, you can go um, up and down, you can go in, around in circles. Today we'll just do a simple uh, demonstration of up and down or back and forth. One of the interesting things is, is that the robot is really just uh, like a digital spring, so it doesn't matter um, where she is, it will find her. She could move around back and forth um, and it won't make uh, any difference to the robot. So the next tool that we'll do, I think Alexa you'll like this one, this is a sports roller. Again this is a, a prototype that we came up with and I think that this would be good for uh, maybe if you're on set all day long and you get off work late, you don't want to be going to a, a massage salon at no. 10 o'clock at night, that's not going to be safe for you. Mm -mm. So this, if you're at the gym or something, your, your hamstrings are tight, uh, you have lactic acid um, in your muscles, this could be something that you could use to roll out. And it feels really good. It feels so good. Sometimes it's a bit ticklish for, for the first time when you do it, yeah. but uh, you quickly get used to it. And this could be changed to any diameter, any pressure, we could do all kinds of different things. So the next tool that we'll do is a uh, what we call our universal tool. This is basically, again, just a prototype. It's a drill chuck. Uh, I went to the hardware store and got a paint um, roller. And uh, hopefully, this feels good. I did this for uh, a group demonstration that I did a few weeks back with a, a bunch of people, 20 or 30 people, and this was definitely a crowd pleaser. It's nice because it can roll over the center of the spine, it can roll over um, the shoulder blades, and still feels really good. What we're really trying to get across to everyone is that it doesn't just have to be the tools that we come up with. It can be tools that you come up with, or that third parties come up with, and they design a tool that will work within our solution. So this Chuck is, again, requiring me to manually change this. This would be something that would be automatic, so you could be in a private room mm -hmm. and um, run this demonstration without anyone there. You could fall asleep. I've used this at uh, our office, and I can fall asleep with this thing going on and on and on, uh -huh. but just with one tool, because we don't have the ability to, to tool change. This is a very interesting one. This is. Um, based off of a snare drum stick and I really like having my back scratched and so I came up with this idea of these little plastic bristles and developed this very soft touch solution that gives the sensation of having your back scratched. And again this is something that um, people could come up with their own ideas of what they want to do, third parties can make tools, will be making tools, that do all kinds of different motions, create different feelings, we can do things that humans can't do. We could add heat, vibration, ultrasonics, uh, electric pulse, um, and any number of different modalities. So this next one is really truly amazing. This is a head scratcher, and if anybody hasn't experienced this, uh, they should definitely look it up on YouTube and see what happens to babies and even dogs where they'll, they just melt when they have the, the first experience with this. When it first touches you, if you do it to yourself, uh, Alexa and I did this originally, right? And we, she did it to herself and then I did it um, for her and there's definitely a different feeling. And she can move around and she can make it feel good the way she wants it to be. And again, this is just sensational feeling. How does that feel, Alexa? So good. So good, I could huh? stay here all day. <laughs> it really is just amazing. So we, we thank you for coming out um, and doing this demonstration with us today. We are, are hopeful that people can see through the video camera what you're experiencing. And, and then we invite people to come out and uh, experience it for yourself. Come and visit us and see just what it's like 
to be touched by a robot. It's pretty cool. Thank you. <laughs>
it will be a $59 monthly subscription that entitles our users to a massage once per week as opposed to once per month. We'll have a demographic or we'll have stores, salons, that will address a demographic that will give us about 1,000 to 1,500 users per store. That will generate about a million dollars in revenue and we plan to grow to a thousand store uh, business or more so that we can be a billion dollar organization like Massage Envy. In addition to selling or operating these doors, we'll also sell robots. We won't sell them to other salons and that would compete against us, but we will sell them to national sports teams or national hotel chains. We'll sell them to the cruise lines. We can sell them to the government or large businesses and campuses, universities, and even high school football teams. I've seen in the news that they have football teams in Texas that uh, at high school that are spending 60 or 70 million dollars on their, their sports teams arenas. So I think that our business model for subscription will be a billion dollar business. I believe that our sales uh, model will be an additional $300 million business. Christian, you keep promising me that you will give me another arm. What are your funding plans moving forward? Alex, that's a good question. We are raising our first seed round of a million dollars to take you from the high functioning prototype that you are today to a minimum viable product, an MVP, that we can use in our first pilot store. Later, we will have two follow-on rounds, a $4 million round that will be for opening our first store and doing some value engineering or additional engineering to give you features that we've learned from our pilot store. Then our last round will be a $15 million round and that will be to open 10 stores and go into more of a growth phase, but then also to value engineer the whole solution to bring the cost down so that we can develop a high functioning commercial unit that could be good for our sales. Why are you doing this now? Why is now the right time? Alex, I've been waiting for years to find an idea like this. I've always wanted to have a robot, but I wanted a robot that would change people's lives. Not just like a Roomba vacuum cleaner, which is very cool, or a trash can lid. I wanted something that would impact our lives and change our human condition. I think when I crashed and broke my back, it might have, I don't know if the stars in my head were from the crash or, or if it was just the stars lining up, but the technology seemed to come together. There was these collaborative robotic arms that allow me to have a robot interact with a person, with people, safely. And at the same time, natural language processing and the ability to talk with you and have a conversation with you in our normal voice. And that's brought about by IBM Watson and other natural language processing solutions. So now is the right time. That's why we developed this. And we think it's going to be something that will change people's lives. Alex, we're at the crossroads now. We have the team behind us to execute and develop the robot quickly. We have collaborative robotic arms that can work with people. We have natural language processing through IBM Watson. And companies like Massage Envy have primed this market for subscription-based massage.
we are ready. We invite all investors, all people, to come and experience Alex, to see and to feel just what it's like to be touched by a robot.